The Unseen World of the Bible, Session 2, God and the Gods. The objectives of this session were to distinguish God, gods, and the sons of God, to describe the divine council in family terms, and to discover our destiny as sons of God. We began with a discussion of what did you learn from Dr. Heiser's book, Supernatural, Chapter 2, titled, God and the Gods. We considered for a few minutes, what are some of the ways in which Americans show their fascination with the supernatural? Of several good replies, a few included these. The supernatural provides an escape from mundane daily life. For some, it's a religious doctrine, including gods, gods, genes, angels, and the sort. Everywhere, there are cultural themes, which might include elves, sprites, ghosts, and goblins. Christians believe that they have experienced a supernatural conversion, what others would call a preternatural experience. For many, it is a logical inference from creation. Even the Bible says that God has set eternity in our hearts. For example, Romans 1.18 reads, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes, both His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Asked, what makes the Holy Bible seem so boring for many folk? Amongst other good replies, we suggested, well, maybe the Bible consists in stories of ordinary folk living a long time ago then much of the Bible sounds like church or Sunday school stories that seem too much like fables. Much of the Bible describes a cultural way of life that seems backward or brutal. Then our translations are often made in a stiff, formal language devoid of passion. And, of course, we have many more addictive things to do. Perhaps overriding all of this is a kind of evangelical rationalism that does not allow for a variety of invisible divine beings. Thirdly, we asked, what are some misconceptions that Christians have about divine beings in the Bible? Well, some common ones include, well, God himself is not particularly interested in me, and so I'm not interested in him. This talk about a divine council seems too weird. It's hard to believe. And angels look like pretty white girls with wings, more like fairies. Some misbelieve that it is the devil or demons who make us commit sins. Others will affirm that there is only one God. And likewise, false gods do not exist. The most common word for God in the Bible is Elohim. But what are Elohim? The very first verse of most Bibles reads, In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. In this verse, Elohim is God, the Creator. Deuteronomy talks about the wicked history of Israel and how many of them sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known, to new gods who came lately, whom your fathers did not dread. In this text, Elohim is a plural equated to demons who are not God. In the account of the witch of Endor, when King Saul asked a necromancer what she saw coming up out of the earth, she replied, I see a divine being, Elohim, 
coming up out of the earth. In this text, Elohim is a human ghost. The Psalms declare, Ascribe to Yahweh, O sons of the mighty, Elohim. Ascribe to Yahweh glory and strength. Here, the term Elohim refers to lesser gods who are not the Creator. By way of summary, the word Elohim applies to any bodiless spirit. Thus, Yahweh himself is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is like Yahweh. We held several minutes of tiny group work in which participants read aloud Psalm 82, finding every mention of divine beings, then answering, What is God doing in verse 1? To whom? What is God doing in verse 6? To whom? And lastly, each group chose someone to report to the class what they found. In verse 1 of Psalm 82, we read, God, Elohim, takes his stand in the congregation of God, El, the most ancient name of God. He judges in the midst of gods, again, Elohim. The singular, for, the singular God, Elohim, is spelled the same as the plural gods, Elohim. And in verse 6, Elohim says, I said, you are gods, Elohim, and all of you are sons of the Most High, Elion. Then in the book of Job, we read that the sons of God came to stand before Yahweh. And later in the book, Yahweh says to men, Were you there when I laid the foundation of the earth? And all the sons of God shouted for joy? Sons of God are some kind of divine beings who are not Yahweh. Well, in the Bible, just who are the sons of God? The expression is used for a number of individuals and groups. For example, Adam is called a son of God in the genealogy of the Gospel of Luke. In Genesis chapter 6, certain fallen divine beings are called sons of God, those who intermingled with the daughters of men. Hosea called Israel God's son. And God, likewise, the kings of Israel. The Lord said, I will be a father to them, and they will be sons to me. And then in Psalm 89, the gods of Gentile nations are called sons of God. When Jesus came, as a human being, the angel who announced his coming said, He will be called the Son of God. And Romans chapter 1, He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. In Galatians 3, we are told that Christian believers have become sons of God. In Romans 8, humans who are led by God's Spirit are indeed the sons of God. In the same chapter, Christians, when resurrected, will be the reigning sons of God. Yahweh is expanding his family by including Gentile sons of God who replace fallen divine sons of God. In the book of Daniel, in the account about King Nebuchadnezzar, who was driven mad and spent seven years crawling the ground like a beast, this edict is by the resolution of the watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones, in order that the living humans may know that the Most High is the powerful ruler over the kingdom of mankind and gives it to whom he wishes. Here we have divine beings known as watchers, similarly as the holy ones. We define watchers as divine beings who watch over the affairs of human kingdoms. We are not limiting the adjective divine to the one God himself, but by convention we are using it to describe 
any bodiless spiritual beings who dwell in the heavens. We then held another tiny group discussion, reading the context of Daniel 4, discussing then what is the role of divine beings in implementing the decrees of the Most High for human kings. The groups reported back several fascinating observations. Then in the big group, we asked, in what ways does the kingdom of God resemble a family business? Some mentioned that, well, the kingdom has a CEO, it has many workers, they may discuss together, but they agree on a plan. Then they implement their work. Well, how does Yahweh resemble a family chief? What does Yahweh expect from family members? One participant summed it up well. Loyalty. Then what happens to family members who rebel? They could be excluded from the family. A very dangerous situation. And what will faithful family members inherit? Well, the business. And in our case, the new heaven and new earth. By way of summary, some of the gods failed Yahweh when they went from good to bad. Yet some humans become sons of God when they go from bad to good. Your assignment for the next session, during your daily Bible reading, watch for mention of gods, angels, demons, and other spiritual beings of various kinds. Read chapter 3 in the book Supernatural, along with cited Bible passages. If you want more, see Dr. Heiser's book, The Unseen Realm. As an addendum, we briefly discussed the real name of the one true God. Should we call him God, Lord, Most High, Elohim, El, Jehovah, Adonai, Yahweh, Allah, have Christian churches been deceived into believing a lie about the name of God? The name of God appears in the Bible in Exodus chapter 3, where we read, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. However, in the next verse, God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Why do the English versions say, The Lord? Let's look at the Hebrew text, transliterated here in Roman letters, and find where God says, I am sent me to you. Here the name of God is Ehyeh. And then in the next verse, he calls himself something else, spelled Y-H-W-H, which this version pronounces as Yahweh. Let's look at this name, Yahweh, translated the Lord. In the first instance, when God said, I am, he employed the first person singular form of the Hebrew verb haya, which means to be. Then he turned around and pronounced the same name, he is, employing the third person singular form of the verb hava, to be. Now the verbs haya and hava were interchangeable in ancient Semitic languages including Hebrew. The form haya was more usual in Western Semitic and the form hava more usual in Southern Semitic. Some scholars suggest that the name Yahweh has a causal force, meaning he who causes to be. Let's look at this more closely. Until about the 6th century BCE or BC, written in a script we call Paleo or Ancient Hebrew, we read Hebrew words from right to left. Thus the name is spelled Y-H-W-H, from right to left. 
In the 5th century BCE, Jews in captivity in Babylon learned to speak Aramaic and began writing Hebrew using Aramaic characters without vowels. If you know a Semitic language, knowing the consonants is enough because the vowel patterns are so regular. So Yahweh now looked like this, still spelled from right to left. By the 12th century AD or CE, when churches were using the Latin language, some were spelling out this name as Yahowa. Latin has no V sound. In the 16th century in Latin, they spelled the name with different consonants, still pronouncing it Yehovah. There's no W in Latin. Also in the 16th century, Christians began transcribing this name in English, Yehovah, because J at that time sounded like I. By the 20th century, Semitic scholars who study languages and compare them across the centuries have mostly concluded that the name was originally pronounced Yahweh or Yahweh.